Father, we ask your Holy Spirit to meet with us and be our teacher. As we think about the uh, government of the church, uh, about the doctrine of office and ordination in church courts, um, this can get kind of dry and dusty, and yet it's very important things about how we function, how we're connected and interconnected with each other in the work of your kingdom. So I pray that you will teach us these things and help us to cover the things that matter and not to get bogged down in things that, are, that won't really be helpful. So we trust you in advance to meet with us and help us during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so when we think about the form of government, um, and ordination in church courts. This is going to overlap a little bit with the very first lesson, which had to do with qualifications for officers. Uh, but this is not so much going to be looking at qualifications, but just the um, uh, God's establishment of a form of government and the connection of the various officers, that, just the whole theology of church office. Uh, is what we're going to look at as the foundational material. This, all of this whole study is dealing with what we're calling theological foundations. That's the <clears throat> broader title, um, and that's deliberate to, s to point out that there's a lot about um, functioning as an officer that we are not able to do because you just can't do it all. You have to select what is the priority stuff. So we're doing our best to try to figure out what is the, the main thing for us to focus on. <clears throat> There's a sense in which every single member of the church is an officer of the church. That's your first uh, set of blanks there. <clears throat> Meaning that every child of God is a prophet, priest, and king. And we're going to look at some scripture associated with this. Um, but before we think about the special and distinct offices of elder and deacon, we need to look at this broader theme of um, every member is an officer. And you've seen this even in recent weeks as we've emphasized bringing people forward who are involved in ministry and talking about what they're doing in ministry, laying hands on them and praying for them. Not that we're setting them apart as elders and deacons in doing that. It's not the same thing. But we're signaling the fact that um, if you are a member of the body of Christ, you are called to ministry. Um, and this background theological teaching is part of what it means actually to be an image bearer. Uh, which, of course, as being image bearer, that image is defaced by sin, but it's being restored by redemption. And there are a couple of passages, uh, there, Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3, that talk about that. It says, put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So look, look at those two words, righteousness and holiness. And then in Colossians 3, put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Again, you'll see there, every child of God is a prophet, priest, and king. Those are the, the three core offices out of which the Bible builds all other teaching on this idea of office. So when you think of righteousness, you think of, of king, rule. Righteousness has to do with uh, doing what is right, not doing what is wrong. It's the dispensing of, of order and structure in the kingdom of God. In terms of holiness, you think of the work of the priest um, as his work was to bring together unholy man and a holy God, and the means by which to do that was through sacrifice, the work of the priest. And then knowledge, you think of the work of the prophet as he conveys the truth of God, the word of God. <clears throat> now, all of this was kind of fulfillment of, 
of uh, Moses' great wish in Numbers 11:29, where he says that he wished that all of the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. You remember that idea. All of the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And that kind of sees fulfillment in Joel 2, in the prophecy that says, And afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And then, of course, in Acts chapter 2, we see that at the day of Pentecost, that was fulfilled. There you had the broader distribution of ministry, gifts, and callings to every person in the body of Christ. That was the great hinge moment in the history of redemption when we see that. There were special offices and officers uh, up to that point, but we see that broader distribution. But this teaching about the universal priesthood of all believers um, is actually reinforced by the rending of the veil in the temple at Christ's death, pointing to the fact that everyone now um, can enter into that priestly function of entering the very presence chamber of God. The veil is rent, the way is open, and so... Uh, and this, all of this teaching uh, is strengthened by some other passages like Revelation 1, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. could be translated, made us to be kings. It, it can be translated kingdom or kings and priests to serve his God and Father. So there you have that very idea of, of, the, of believers sharing in this prophet, priest, and king um, roles or callings. And then in 1 Peter 2, um, Peter says, You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his mar marvelous light. Royal priesthood combines royal, kingship, priesthood, priest. So now the, all of this is what R.B. Kuyper develops in his book, The Glorious Body of Christ, when he talks about um, this foundational concept of um, office and calling to office. And he says there, precisely express the special offices, being like elder and deacon, are rooted in the universal office. By the way, where I am uh, is... You found it? Okay. All right. <clears throat> um, the special offices are rooted in this universal office possessed by every believer and for that reason the members of the church choose or ought to choose their own officers in such churches as the Roman Catholic and the Greek Catholic the officers are not ordinarily chosen from below but are appointed from above it's a top down rather than a bottom up kind of uh, hierarchy the simple explanation is that these churches deny to all intents and purposes, the universal office of believers that, and a church which gives full recognition to the universal office of believers will insist that its members choose their own officers. Um, in other words, the, the special offices of elders and deacons are primarily servant leaders or player coaches of the other officers to help them execute and exercise their callings. The way we put it around here is that elders are not the only ones who eld and deacons are not the only ones who deek. <laughs> but elders are involved in um, 
and being these player coaches in the shepherding and the care and the oversight of the people constantly pushing ministry down to the grassroots. And their role is not to, um, to do ministry as much as to facilitate it. Obviously, a player coach is doing it as well as um, mentoring and teaching it, but um, that's the, the whole emphasis in our uh, form of government. And it, our structure uh, is designed to do this possibly more than any other form of church government. So let's summarize what we're saying here. Um, the first thing is that the office of prophet, a prophet obviously is a proclaimer, so you think more of the ministry of the word there. And we see the, the scriptural office of prophet coming to expression in the New Testament era with the teaching elder. And that whole function is didactic. It's instructional in nature. Then the office of the priest, which is the ministry of mercy and service, we see come to expression in the New Testament church with deacons. And a, a key word to kind of define that function or that role is distribution. They are distributing uh, resources and so forth to people based on needs, usually physical needs, but not only physical needs. Um, they're, they're loneliness busters. Uh, the ministry of mercy through deacons can take on a variety of, of uh, flavors. Now, the, the role of the king, we don't have any king in the church any longer, other than Jesus, of course, uh, he is our king, but he mediates the ministry of rule through elders, specifically ruling elders, and you can think of that function as direction. So you have the didactic piece in the teaching elder, you got the distributional piece um, among the deacons, and you got the directional piece um, demonstrated by elders. And so does this help you to see how you connect these special offices, elder and deacon, to that theological foundation that all of God's people are prophet, prophets, priests, and kings. See that connection? All right. Now let's look at the various forms of church government. <clears throat> um, there's first of all the so-called prelatical or episcopal form of government. You've heard of the Episcopalian church. The, but the episcopal form of government is the form of government that is found um, among Roman Catholics, Anglicans, um, and the Episcopal Church in America, of course, is the Anglican Church, essentially, in America. And then most Methodists, uh, which the Methodists kind of grew out of the Anglican Church. By the way, the word a prelate means, it, it's Latin, meaning to place before in esteem. I don't think that's in your notes, but if you're wondering what that strange word means, you've heard of the term a prelate uh, before. It's, um, and it's a, uh, a Latin, see the word episkopos is a Greek word, but prelate is a Latin word that, that means not exactly the same thing, but it's something very similar uh, to place before in esteem. So the principle is a hierarchy of rank or office in a kind of ministerial order that maintains a kind of diocesan episcopate. That is to say, there's a, you know, down at the lower level you have just the, the parish clergyman and then at, the, at a higher level you might uh, have uh, somebody that's in between the parish clergy and the bishop of a given region, and then you have an archbishop of a whole country, and then you have um, maybe the archbishop or the pope, as in the case of the Roman Catholic Church, who is the bishop of the bishops. And uh, notice that uh, in this situation, clergy rule is the order of the day. In other words, the government of the church is done by the clergy. The laity 
never have any role as far as government. Now they, they've created um, various kinds of, of entities, um, lay organizations that function in a kind of an advisory role, but there's no actual constitutional authority in the laity in the rule of the church. <clears throat> it's, it's a very, um, and you can see how that this would fan the, the flames of, of um, clericalism, so-called, uh, where this is kind of this clergy di uh, laity dichotomy. And the clergy are up here and they're the holy people and you want to talk to God and so you go and you talk to one of the clergy and they take your message to God and then they, you come back later and they tell you what God said. You know, it's a, it creates that human mediator um, syndrome. And so in the rest of Roman Catholic theology that, um, that pretty much puts in the hands of the priesthood uh, the exercise of discipline, the administration of the sacraments, and so on and so forth. And it can only come through them. You can see how it creates an enormous dependency and a, a, de a, a deference on the part of the people to the clergy. So rather than the clergy being servants of the people and being under the people and pushing them up and forward in their ministry and their God, uh, God callings, welcome back. Um, instead of that happening, instead you have uh, the specialists. You know, they, they've gone to special, get special training. They've, and, and <laughs> boy, isn't it amazing how you take a good thing and you push it to an extreme and it becomes a monstrosity? There is a good thing about receiving special training. And there is, uh, you know, um, nothing wrong with that. But, uh, once you embrace that kind of top-down structure, it produces like a monarchy. In a monarchy, you have a king, he's in charge, and everybody else, you know, kisses the ring of the king. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> now, the other form of government, other than this prelatical or episcopal form of government, Rick, if you can just kind of point, him, uh, point real fast to where we're located. <clears throat> The other form of government besides the prelatical or episcopal form of government is congregational. Um, and <clears throat> this is the form of government that doesn't have any kind of gradation in the ministerial office, but at the same time opposes the idea of a gradation of church courts. And so it insists on the independency of each congregation giving to church members the decision in all church matters without subjecting the congregational judgment to the review of any higher court or judica judicature. What's interesting that I've observed, now that's a form of government that you would have, let's say, uh, in Baptist. Baptist churches uh, are very much that way. All of the power is, is in the local church and in the congregation. But what I, and the only elder, if you will, would be the pastor. They equate pastor and elder are the same thing. And then they also would have deacons, let's say. But the elder uh, is like one person. So you can see how um, constitutionally every decision has to be made by the congregation, right? But that's a rather chaotic situation. And so what is often the real government, not the one that's, that's written and codified constitutionally, but the one that's the actual functional government, is uh, a form of local church-focused prelatical government. It, te it tends to produce the, um, the king pastor. Have you all observed that phenomenon in Christendom? where there's this, you know, uh, pretty much the pastor just decides whatever's going to happen in the church. <laughs> he may or may not, to one degree or another, consult the deacons or uh, tell them what he's decided. <laughs> but um, there's a, that's an interesting phenomenon that we see in that particular form of government. And I think it's, it, 
it's actually in order to secure some order out of the chaos that that arises. Because let's face it, benevolent monarchies are very, very streamlined, organized forms of government. <laughs> it's pretty simple. One guy decides what to do and lays it down and that's, that's the law. So um, we call this member rule or democratic structure. Do you remember in the history of the world a structure like that of, of any kind of civil government? There's only in the history of the world, as far as I know, one example of a civil government that was a true democracy. Our form of government is not a democracy, it's a republic, and they're different. It has democratic principles in it, but it's not a true democracy. The only form of government I know of in the history of the world that was a true democracy was the Greek city-states, where every citizen was also a member of the ruling council of the city. And again, what happened was it produced strong men who took charge and, and, and brought uh, order out of the chaos. So the, the tyranny of the majority is what that uh, tends to lead to. Then there's a Presbyterian form of government, which is neither Episcopal or Prelatical nor Congregational. And this insists upon a parity or an equality of ministerial rank, both lay and clergy elders, while recognizing a gradation in church courts through session, presbytery, uh, some denominations have synods, or the uh, General Assembly. The PCA has session, presbytery, and General Assembly. We really don't have synods. Now, <clears throat> this is uh, instead of clergy rule, like a monarchy, or member rule like a democratic structure, this is, this is a representative rule system where you have um, those that are chosen to be elders who rule representatively. But notice I've called it a constitutional monarchy rather than a constitutional republic. Why would I do that? Why would I call it a constitutional monarchy, the Presbyterian form of government? Monarch means what? One. Um, yeah, but a, a one ruler, but a king is a monarch, mm -hmm. <clears throat> right? Jesus Christ. Bingo. See, we do have a king. So we're not... I'm going to talk about the connection between Presbyterian form of government and the American civil uh, form of government in a moment, but they're not an exact one-to-one -one comparison um, because um, we do have a king. But So the form of civil government that we would most be like would actually be more like Great Britain than like America, but even there the analogy breaks down at some critical points. But... Um, there, uh, though the elders or the rulers hold office as representatives of the people, they're not merely delegates of the people. In other words, when we elect elders, they, they do not have constituents. <laughs> like members of Congress have constituents, right? The people are involved in electing the elders, but when an elder becomes an elder, the one that he really ultimately answers to is King Jesus. You see the, the difference? How that this is a, a bit of a hybrid, hybridized form here. So their ultimate responsibility is to Christ, the head of the church, which again is this kind of constitutional monarchy. Louis Burkhoff in his Systematic Theology says, the election by the people is merely an external confirmation of the inner calling by the Lord himself. Moreover, the elders, though representatives of the people, do not derive their authority from the people, but from the Lord of the church. They exercise rule over the house of God in the name of the king and are responsible unto him. So that's, um, 
that's an important understanding of, of, of what happens uh, there. Now, that when I say that we don't have constituents, that doesn't mean that we're not sensitive to uh, the concerns, needs, desires, opinions of the people. Um, but, for example, recently in this decision over the land and all that, and, and what we did was we had a couple of town hall meetings to provide an opportunity to get a good feedback loop going so that... Um, we're not leading the church in some way that's just grossly tangent to the de desires of the congregation, particularly in an issue like uh, real property. We actually have a constitutional and fiduciary uh, rules binding us. That that's a congregational decision. There are a couple of areas where the congregation actually votes. They vote in the selection of officers, and they vote in real property. Did you have a question? Well, I was going to say, um, I would think, having been a part of congregational uh, uh, forms of government, forms of government before, that they would say they do have a higher authority in Christ than yes. the scripture. And yes, yes, they, they would. They would say the same thing about having... Um, ultimate responsibility to Christ as the head of the church. I think they would, they would say that. Oh, yes, they would. They're not completely independent. That's correct. In fact, all these would. All, all of these forms of government, and thank you for that. To be fair, yeah, I, I know that I'm somewhat creating straw men here. And even out of Presbyterianism, I'm creating a bit of a straw man here, just to try to show the distinctions. Okay. Uh, but yes, uh, all of them would. And And by the way, a lot of, of what I have seen in the congregational form of government where you had a benevolent mar monarchy, there was, in, in a number of those situations, a lot of relative peace and harmony. Uh, the, the most difficult situations I've seen with the congregational form of government is where the, 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 the constitutional form, namely congregationalism, was strictly applied and virtually every decision was decided by the congregation and, and it created, you can see why, you got that many people, that many voices and you got to try to all figure out how to come together somehow. That could create a very cumbersome uh, process. Um, but the modified forms of congregationalism that I've seen, some of them were reasonably efficient or at least as much so as a lot of Presbyterian churches. Now, most Presbyterians maintain what's called a jus divinum, a kind of a divine right Presbyterianism, meaning that that's the view that's actually found in Scripture. You've got a couple of different views you could take here, see. You could say, well, the Bible gives us these broad principles, but we've got to kind of figure it out. And Presbyterianism is one way to figure it out. Congregationalism is another. Episcopacy is another. But, you know, who really knows? We're just doing the best we can uh, because the Bible doesn't give us a lot of clear leading on it. But most people who embrace the Presbyterian form of government do believe that at least the fundamental principles, if not the individual particulars, are taught in Scripture. Um, this one author, um, John McPherson, who wrote a book back in mid-20th century on the subject of Presbyterianism, said on the contrast between the congregational democracy and Presbyterial constitutionalism. He said, a democracy in church or state wanting or lacking the representative principle oscillates between anarchy and tyranny. Constitutionalism preserves democracy from overthrow in either of these extremes. In matters of church organization and government, Presbyterianism is the constitutionalism which at once recognizes popular rights assigning the right of church power to the whole church and conserves these rights for the adequate accomplishment of those ends for which they have been uh, conferred. Now, let me show you a chart on page 9 in your notes. It's kind of an addendum at the end that's drawn from G.I. Williamson's uh, work on the Westminster Confession. And what you see in the left-hand column are the uh, scriptural principles and their uh, uh, 
verse linkages or references. And then you see the hierarchical form, which would be uh, Episcopal or Prelatical, the Congregational form, and Presbyterian. And, and by the way, there, there are some hybrid uh, versions of that. There have been Congregationalist churches, for example, had that even that name that did have elders. Some of the uh, early American New England Congregationalist churches had elders. Well, how did they do that? Well, they read their Bibles, they saw elders, and they decided to have some. <laughs> so I'm not exactly sure how that worked out, <laughs> even though they were Congregationalists. And the... Jonathan Edwards, you've heard that name, one of the great American theologians, he was a, a Congregationalist with regard to his understanding of church government, but his church had elders. To be very honest with you, I'm not sure how they brought those two things together. At any rate, you got the principle that Christ alone is the head of the church, and this would tr be true, uh, it'd be affirmed at least, both by Congregationalists and Presbyterians. But um, in the hierarchical form, they say, yes, Christ is the head of the church, but there's also an earthly head of the church, namely the bishop, or the archbishop, or in the case of the Roman church, the pope, who's actually referred to as the head of the church. Did you know that? Same title as Christ. Now, uh, what about elders chosen by the people over whom they are to rule? And we, you see those passages shown there. Well, hierarchicalism doesn't have that because the leaders are not chosen by the people. They're chosen by the bishop or bishops. Uh, congregationalism and Presbyterianism, that's both true. All ruling officers, uh, that is, elder bishops, are equal in authority. You see that in the passages referred to there, that concept of parity or equality. And that's, again, not true within hierarchicalism because there are, even among the clergy, there's a gradated order of superior rank. Of, cardinals, bishops. Yeah. So long. Cardinals, archbishops, bishops, monsignors, I never have known exactly what a monsignor is. I even ask a Roman Catholic, a devoted Catholic, what's a monsignor? And he scratched his head and said, I don't know. I know one kind will of... ask him sometime. I'm sorry? I know one will ask him sometime. Yeah, ask him. <laughs> what's the difference between monsignor and um, just a, a, a parish priest, yeah. the, the pastor of a, of a given parish church? Um, it's something in between, has some administrative responsibilities between the parish priest and the bishop. Mm -hmm. But I'm not exactly sure how they would define it. But at any rate, um, they're not equal in authority, whereas in both Congregationalists and Presbyterians there.